If you take some of the dusty back roads in Tucson, Arizona, far enough away from what seems like the whole of humanity, you'll come across the nursery of Mihil Piet, a PhD candidate in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Arizona, and owner of Prickly Prospects. His favorite cacti are columnar cacti, and particularly cacti that are found in Brazil, many of which are threatened or endangered, and for which he's most interested in propagating and conserving to disseminate to botanic gardens and other plant lovers. I visited his nursery to do a tour and hear about some of his work. This is brought to you by my new podcast, Bad Seeds. Organized crime syndicates have been diversifying their portfolios beyond drugs. Some cartels mine iron. Others steal gasoline and grow avocados. The Sinaloa cartel has an alarmingly large stake in Mexico's legal seafood industry. And now they're moving into succulents. In the case of the missing fishermen, rescuers would find two of them alive, not far from where the succulents grow. One was uninjured, but the other was stained in blood, clutching a bullet wound. Not far from them, officials found dozens of tubs filled with Dudleya pachyphytum. And near those bins was the lifeless body of one of their friends, face down on the rocks. These are single-use brushes so that there's no accidental cross-pollination or hybridization going on since the integrity of the, the data associated with these plants is uh, very important. So we go in and with the little makeup brush, we get some pollen. And now it's on the brush. And then we go back in over here and just get that pollen in there and just do the reverse. And that should be forming a fruit in a few weeks. Now, do you need to like put a bag over those flowers or anything like that? Uh, ideally, yes, but um, in this case, I won't be doing so, um, as I'll likely discard the fruit. Uh, in this case, I'm not actively propagating these right now, or I'll make sure to add a note that it was open pollinated technically. To uh, do this properly, I should protect uh, the flower as soon as it opens up and make sure that nothing else comes along and can cause problems there. Not all cacti hybridize, but a lot of them do. And there are some cacti out there that pretty much only self-pollinate. So there's a little bit. And sometimes when that pollination is successful, you get fruit, like in this case. It's a type of mammillaria? Yes, correct. Yeah. You can pick off one of the fruits. And should be seeds inside if everything went well. Some, and there seems to be some seed in there. Yeah, some little tiny seeds. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And sometimes these fruits actually taste kind of good. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say sometimes, uh, you know, that, that is one thing that on the Apuntia, at least, they harvest some of that fruit and it tastes like a nice, juicy, sugary watermelon. I haven't explored too much with the fruits. Um, but yes, I, I absolutely adore prickly pear ice cream. So, um, Here's a species from the Caribbean of the genus Dendroceras. It grows into a very tall tree in habitat. And there's only two species in that genus. This one's virtually unknown in cultivation. Um, and on top of that, the IUCN hasn't been able to assess it since we simply don't have enough data for this species to determine what its conservation status is out in the wild. And that probably has to do with the wavy ribs. Mm. Then I also have some Galapagos cacti. Um, big parts of the Galapagos are dry. And so when people think about the Galapagos and biology, they think about uh, the evolution of finches uh, and the tortoises. tortoises yeah. uh, but what, what's less commonly mentioned is that the same thing happened with the Galapagos prickly pears. So um, a lot of the different islands have their own um, type of prickly pear. It's tough to say whether they're different species or not, as there seems to be very little genetic diversity, but they do have very distinct growth forms in a lot of cases. This one is Opuntia megasperma from the Galapagos. Um, 
And so um, what's interesting is that there's definitely coevolution going on with some of the tortoises in the Galapagos. So a lot of these typically pairs in areas where um, they're exposed to tortoises a lot will actually grow into very tall tree-like structures with very heavy uh, uh, wooden tissue near the bottom of the so plant. they get really lignified yeah. down below. Exactly. So that the tortoises can't gnaw on them, or it's at least like not pal palatable for them. Yes, exactly. That's how it works. Part of the Galapagos story, it's not just the animals, it's also the plants. I see some type of, looks like Kleinia or Senecio yes. blooming yes, absolutely. right here. That's definitely something people like it. I just randomly acquired it a few years ago. It's a pretty plant, but it definitely gets out of hand. <laughs> um, and the flowers are, are pretty nice though. A lot of uh, cacti will take on this uh, farina, as it's called. It's a, bl um, a blue whitish coating mm -hmm. on the epidermis. And it, um, it's mostly for sun protection, but it looks absolutely amazing in the right. Yeah, and it's great in landscapes. I mean, a lot of plants that grow in really sunny conditions have that mm -hmm. farina on their leaves or stem, in this case, stems. I love the form. Yes. Uh, that's one of my favorites over there. Yeah. It looks like a prickly pear. Mm -hmm. Technically, it's not. It's from the genus Consolea, which is in that same subfamily of uh, cacti. But, um, and we can see it in a little bit more detail later, but that one comes from the Florida Keys. There's uh, quite a few species down there, including another big columnar cactus. And most of the Florida species of cactus in general are very, very endangered. In this case, this is one of the rare cacti groups that has separate male and female individuals. And so, unfortunately, um, we don't know if this is natural or because of uh, habitat destruction. We are only aware of males left in the wild. Oh, so man. all of the plants are propagated clonally. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, this specific plant might be from an extinct population on Big Pine Key. But there is another population, a very small one left, and there was a new one discovered uh, uh, fairly recently as well that seems to be larger. But that one, as far as I know, hasn't really been tested yet in terms of whether it re represents a different genetic clone. Well, holler if you know you have a female. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that one is Cons Consolia corallicola, or Florida semaphore cactus. One of my favorites. I like the growth form. A lot of prickly pears will just have the same shape pads all throughout. Um, but the genus Consolea is known for its very elongated central trunk and then forming a very, very balanced pattern. And it just screams to hug me uh, at you, in, in my opinion. Yeah, um, it, it, it looks like it's in a total celebration or elation. And like you said, it has a beautiful symmetry as well. This plant over here is an epiphytic cactus. Looks like a Ripsalis. Correct, absolutely. So this specific species of Ripsalis is a lithophyte, which means it grows on rocks. Um, it is from Brazil, uh, near Rio de Janeiro, and it was uh, thought to be extinct at one point. Um, and if I remember correctly, the type collection, uh, the herbarium material, might have been destroyed in World War II. Not 100% sure of that. Okay, a lot of Ripsalis are mm -hmm. endangered or threatened. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And so there's a very intense concentration of endangered cacti in Brazil in particular. So that's one of the areas that we really do need to focus conservation attention on. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, um, plants were rediscovered in uh, Rio de Janeiro, not many of them. Um, and yeah, this is, this is one of them. I have a couple different clones and um, I'm hoping to get seed going this year. Um, it's very easy to propagate from cuttings, of course. Uh, like most Ripsalis are, but um, we need to maintain a genetic diversity. Some of my species of Ripsalis get this little, uh, exude this little sugary crystal that comes out and I'm like, I wonder if that's for ants or some other symbiosis with an insect. Yeah, so there's some uh, people out there that do study the, uh, they're called extrafloral nectaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, one person that does so is uh, Jackson Burkholder, um, who's closely associated with the Cactus and Succulent Society of America. Um, and we're only just now starting to understand which uh, different species form those exafloral nectaries. Uh, prickly pears are known for it, um, in, or choys are known for it in a lot of cases. Some barrel cacti as well, but they're very intense uh, mutualisms with ants. 
uh, that get nectar in return for the fence. Um, but yes, some ripsalas do it as well. This one looks uh, funky. Yeah, so that's a native species here, a very common one, um, Salinar Bundia fulgada. It's one that I don't, uh, I try to not mess with <laughs> because the parts come off, the segments come off very easily and they're very painful. So I try to keep most of my choyas in the second greenhouse over there. And what's fun, uh, what's interesting about choyas is that they have this papery sheath over their spines that just comes off. Oh yeah, look at that. Mm -hmm. This is also a common one in cultivation. Yes. I have a few of these. Absolutely. So uh, that one is a really, really variable species in the wild. So you can um, just walk a few hundred feet and the plants vary from uh, having these papery spines to having no spines at all. And so that's a very local variation and it's definitely not enough to uh, describe a separate species, mm -hmm. especially since they all integrate very easily. But like a, for a form or variation, I think yeah. it'll be enough to say. This is a representative of one of the most smuggled genera of cacti out there. This is Copiapoa hasseltoniana. Yes. Um, and so we've been working on a new conservation plan to protect this genus in LA, uh, including a bunch of na um, national stakeholders, uh, local stakeholders, and then international stakeholders as well. Um, these are very slow growing. And in the wild, some of those plants out there are three, four hundred years old and look absolutely stunning. And unfortunately, people are willing to pay a lot of money for them. And um, just uh, recently, a few years ago, um, smugglers were caught with a very big shipment in Italy, I believe. And so those plants were confiscated and shipped back to Chile, where they're now residing in a purpose-built greenhouse by the government over there to uh, uh, keep them going. Correct, and I think some of the funds that Liz from Bee Willow in Maryland were able to actually put some of those uh, back into the wild, which just yeah. goes to show how, how um, just a little stuff goes a long way. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we, we all wish that we wouldn't have to spend money on uh, putting plants back into the ground. Um, that were poached. Not all of them, of unfortunately, not all of them make it back into the ground. Some of them get incinerated or are sent to a botanic garden if they're lucky. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, in one thing that we should definitely work on in the US is making sure that most of these shipments that are intercepted do make it to proper uh, uh, CITES repositories. And that's not always the case. They often do get destroyed. And from a conservation perspective, that is not great. But most of the um, plants that are intercepted by customs are not poached plants, but simply people who are trading internationally, but not doing so with the proper uh, permits and paperwork and so on. And in those cases, uh, it's my personal opinion that we do need to work on uh, more common sense le legislation that's not based on animals and more focused on plants to also allow um, international conservation projects because it's become even difficult for um, gardens um, in different countries to do any sort of exchanges of uh, endangered material. And that's something that stands into, in the way of conservation, even though it's intended to help with it. Here's another uh, interesting plant from Costa Rica, Webrocerus forningiorum. And it is from a single uh, population that we know of, just south of uh, San Jose. And so Costa Rica does have a bunch of cacti as well. We wouldn't normally think of when you think about Costa Rica. That's right, absolutely. Um, this is one of my favorites because of the uh, fluffy hair. The new growth looks very intensely red. Now, there's only, um, at least commonly, there's, there's only really one common clone outside of Costa Rica. And uh, the spot that the population is in is very, very heavily guarded, um, at least the location information itself. So even though in, in my case I do work with conservation and so on, I, I haven't been able to get access to uh, uh, information on where, where specifically the plant grows. Hmm. Um, well, in a way it's kind of good if it's heavily guarded in that capacity. Absolutely. Costa Rica has been very good as a country in general as far as conservation goes. Absolutely. Uh, they're definitely one of the model, model countries for environmental issues in my opinion. Um, however, it also causes issues with research. Um, for example, this is one of the species that's critically endangered 
and I uh, do climate change modeling, and I can only do so if I have those data available. Right. And so um, the data are out there, but even with, in an academic position, it's sometimes very, very difficult to get access to those data, and so I haven't been able to model it. So we don't know how it will respond to climate change. Is this a plant, just one more question, mm -hmm. some of those long hairs, sometimes I see some of those long hairs when there's cacti growing on like edges near the ocean and they collect kind of like the, the fog collection. collection or ocean. So they're, um, I am not sure in this case what the role is of the hairs. That could definitely have something to do with it. Um, Fog collection is currently being more heavily investigated. There's a researcher up at the Desert Botanical Gardens in Phoenix who's currently looking at the fog collection capacity of uh, spines. And so some of the species of cactus have very intricate spination, uh, especially when looked at under a microscope. I was going to say, if you look at under a microscope, especially when you're looking at trichomes or anything like that, exactly. you might be able to intuit <laughs> where that cacti is from just by some micro microscopy <laughs> who knows well, i have a better example on the other side but this is one of those species that has an absolutely amazing spine pattern this is actually a mammillaria even though it doesn't look like it and so it has very long individual tubercles it's so cute look at them they're like in little cushions mm -hmm. one interesting aspect about this species is that uh, if I remember the story correctly, is that it was discovered based on a specimen on a lady's uh, front porch in a little tin can where it was growing. So she'd obviously like dug it up somewhere in the area. And she didn't know where, it, she didn't remember where it came from. And so it was described um, pretty much based on that specimen. And then um, it took several years to be able to find it in habitat because of course the, it doesn't get much bigger than that. Of course, trying to find something this size that retreats into the rocks during a dry season is, is, very, is very difficult. Yeah, I, I think it was in a tin can, and I, I think it might have been in a restaurant or something, and the, oh, okay. the gentleman had asked about it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm also quite into uh, uh, stapeliates of the family Apocynaceae. Mm -hmm. So they don't look very impressive without flowers in a lot of cases. Uh, there's some beautiful stems out there and so on but uh, the flowers are absolutely amazing. They're mostly fly pollinated. And uh, yeah, they, some of them Smelled can be quite- I saw it. Mm -hmm, Exactly, <laughs> some of them can be quite stinky. So I don't have a good nose for it, but there are folks who just uh, describe the smell and use that as a way to like recognize them. Yeah, this, is this an Apuntia type or what is- So that is once again, like one of those weird genera yeah. that is closely related to Apuntia, but okay. it's not. So this is a genus called the Singa from uh, Brazil. That's most likely the Singa in Amuna. Mm -hmm. um, the flowers are amazing and the fruits are orange. I'll show them to you in a little bit on the other side. So once they mature, they're orange and they stay on the plant for quite a long time and they're, they're stunning. So. It's nice and fleshy, you know? Yeah. Here's another one of my favorites. This is Arohadoa. Uh, this one is Multiflora from Brazil. Ooh, it's like waxy. Yes. Almost like a, it kind of almost looks a little bit Colin Coey esque the mm -hmm. colors. Yeah, I, and I feel that the, the flowers themselves at this stage look like some of the little plantlets that grow along the Calancho uh, leaf margins. So they tend to be very narrow and a little bit gangly, but the flowers just look absolutely stunning. They all have that waxy appearance, but the, um, the colors can vary. So some of them look like candy corn, um, mm -hmm. and, but this one is absolutely stunning. And right behind it actually is a prickly pear, an endangered prickly pear from the United States. So this is a subspecies of Opuntia bacillaris um, from California. And it's often called, I believe, the Bakersfield uh, um, beaver tail cactus. Mm -hmm. And it's very endangered in the wild, unfortunately. That is Just one. from over collection or development or a combination? I believe uh, mostly development, yes. I don't think there's heavy poaching with prickly pears in most cases, as they're not as popular from a horticultural perspective in many cases. Um, here's another one from the Galapagos. This is uh, the one big tall columnar cactus that you'll find in the Galapagos. 
And um, of course, it's illegal at this point to take anything out of the Galapagos. But back in the day, there were some collectors, including um, biologists for official purposes. And this is one of those colognes that has been propagated for a very long time. Um, so I have a few different clones, and I'm hoping to um, eventually get them to uh, sexually mature, uh, to sexually mature, and then uh, make sure that the species does live on uh, in cultivation. It's doing fairly well in the wild, but uh, for a lot of these endemic island species, the impacts of climate change would, uh, in a lot of cases, mean they have nowhere to go. They can't disperse or migrate to keep up with suitable climate. How long does it take for one of these, do you know, to be sexually mature? No, as far as I know, nobody knows. Okay. Um, probably would be a few more decades. So uh, one of the things I'm doing right now in terms of my focus is uh, focusing on those columbies so that hopefully I'll still be around when they do reach maturity. Yeah. Good thing you're starting young. <laughs> so these uh, flats of plants over here are part of this Brazilian uh, conservation project. And so most of these species first time in cultivation and there are some more critically endangered ones. And so we made sure that um, the initial batches went to the Huntington Botanical Gardens yes. in California. And uh, so the rest of them are sticking around here and are being spread around. There's definitely some interesting critters in the greenhouse as well. Like uh, down in here is an exact of what probably will be a black widow. Ooh. So lots of those in here. That and rattlesnakes. Here's another one. Um, sometimes there's gems in cultivation and we're not even aware of it. This is Brazil Acerus feacanthus, a Brazilian species. So once again, more of a shrubby plant. But uh, it was pretty much unknown in cultivation as well. But uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, a worker at a nursery in California put the pictures of a plant and flower that they just had sitting in their garden. And they weren't propagating it, they didn't know what it was, they didn't, you know, they didn't really care about it very much. And so but with the flowers, uh, a, fr a friend and I were able to figure out what it was. And so it's definitely very valuable, once again, from a conservation perspective, mm. uh, even though it doesn't have original locality data. Now, when I was saying a lot of people don't collect um, choyas and prickly pears because, well, obvious reasons. Uh, there are definitely exceptions, um, and this is one of uh, the more popular choya species. This is Cylindropuntia hystrix from Cuba. And so um, it grows heavily around Guantanamo Bay, and it is critically endangered over there. Uh, but absolutely amazing spines on that one. Very yellow. Yes, and that's not something that um, folks think of when they think about choyas. Mm -hmm. Those yellows, that yellow spination is absolutely amazing. I'm unfortunately not skinny enough to go through this way, so we'll have to go, go around. Maybe we'll find some more things here along the way.
Ah, here is one of those with a very, uh, that's, that's probably going to be tested soon for its fog collection ability. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, mealybugs are also common with cacti, yes. and the spines almost look like little mealybugs. And stapeliads. Yes. <laughs> Stapeliad, can mealybugs and stapeliads go hand in hand? So, this is uh, Mammalaria pectiniferum. A uh, very beautiful species. Uh, it does kind of look like the, if you're looking down on top of a mealybug. Absolutely. It looks. <laughs> and sometimes you find some mutants as well. Um, you, you, of course, know about like cresting plants, mm -hmm. uh, variegation yes. and so on. And this is one of those monstrous forms of a mammalaria. I believe the person that uh, originally well, discovered it, I suppose, um, lives in Tucson. And this is uh, Mammalaria fred. It's what they called it. <laughs> Here's a fun one. This is uh, a genus called Melocactus. And there's... Um, like it just flowered. Yes, that one has some flowers on it, it looks like. So this one is from the base of the Andes. It's a little bit more cobalt tolerant than a lot of Melocactus, which are Caribbean. But what's interesting about them is that they stop growing, or their main cactus stem stops growing when they're sexually mature and they form this big cap on top of them. And a cap can come in different colors. So there's white ones, uh, more and more pinkish and red ones and so on. And so the main stem stops growing and just that caps, cap keeps growing. So sometimes you end up with a cactus with a big cap on top of it. And that's where the flowers uh, come out. The flowers are not very impressive at all. Mm -hmm. And then the fruit. There's only the genus Melocactus that does it and then another one called Disco Cactus. And I wish I could show you a disco cactus flower, but unfortunately, um, so in the case of disco cactus, the flower also comes from the cephalium, which is what the cap is called. And in the morning of the day that it'll flower, you won't see the flower at all. It's just hidden in a cephalium. And then over the course of the day, it'll grow to its um, size that it'll open up at, and then late at night, it'll open. It's an incredibly fragrant flower. You'll definitely see, uh, smell them before you see them. More like jasmine or? Um, I would say like lemony for the Lem species that I've experienced. And so by the morning, the flower will be gone. It will be completely wilted. So it'll grow several inches throughout the day and then open up and that's... This reminds me of like those, the nipple cacti or the boob, <laughs> those <laughs> ones. Is that, does that come from this species or no? No, so uh, in the case of booby cactus, as yeah. it's called, I think I have one sitting over here if you want to get it in a shop. Oh yeah, that's substantial. Mm hmm absolutely. So uh, that one and a bunch of other interesting forms derive from a typical looking columnar cactus. It, it doesn't look very distinct at all, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of crazy variations that happen with it. And they can even crest. I have a crested specimen, which is one of my first plants when I moved here to Tucson. I love the crested specimens. And it, it means, conservation-wise, it's not very valuable, but it just means a lot to me personally. Yeah. Here it is. So, same species as uh, uh, the one that booby cactus is derived from. This one does have a lot of the same features, though it just looks exactly. a, a little more um, S and M, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I wouldn't uh, mess around with that one too much, in <laughs> yeah, that sense. Exactly. Uh, although there are reports, I believe, medical reports of uh, people having tried things like that. <laughs> but yeah, in this case, it's natural. The um, the, the tubercles being, um, you know, very uh, very thick. Um, what but species is this, though? It's um, probably now called Chlysocactus. It's in a group called Luxantoceras. This is most likely Parvi okay. And so originally it came to us under the name uh, Samnensis, I believe. And um, when it got, got a little bit larger, it became clear it's most likely this other species. Mm -hmm. And a close friend of mine who uh, seems to enjoy reading botanical descriptions a lot more than I do, uh, spent some time figuring out what it is, and that's most likely this species, which is also absent in cultivation altogether. Now, when I look at some crested or monstrous cacti, mm -hmm. I mean, some of them, I, I wouldn't, if you didn't know their provenance, like, how would you know what species they're from? Because some of them are so unlike Absolutely. their, you know, where they had originally stemmed from. And I find them and I'm like, I can't tell what species that is. Yes, there are definitely some cultivars out there in the, in the succulent uh, trade that we have no idea what the original species is. And so uh, now with uh, 
genetics be, genetic studies being being um, a little cheaper than they used to be, we're slowly trying to uh, figure those things out. Mm. Um, here's another one that looks like it might be a monstrous cactus, but it's not. This is its natural growth form. So I'm gonna try to pick it up here without it falling into pieces. Oh, wow. so this is a prickly pear relative. Funky hands. Yes. Like alien hands. Absolutely. It's from South America. It's a natural growth form. Whoa. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a, something you'd find under the ocean. Yes. Or something. Yeah, it's a very strange plant. Funky antlers. <laughs> How about this? <laughs> so that plant, this plant is important both from a conservation perspective as well as uh, personally because of the story behind it. So there was a collector, his name was Jorgen Menzel in California, uh, who was really into this genus of cactus. This is a close relative of Arizona Queen of the Night, uh, which um, sometimes, uh, the flowers are so impressive that sometimes uh, botanical gardens will open up at night just so simply that people can go uh, watch them open up. So this is a relative, Penioceras Lazaro Cardenasii uh, from Mexico. And yeah, you can absolutely touch them. They're not that bad at all mm -hmm. when it comes to cactus. Um, but this um, person, Jurgen, um, collected these very heavily and tried to make sure that um, they would persist um, in cultivation. And he was always looking for a second clone, which only now recently we've been able to find one and enter it into cultivation. So it's endangered in the wild. Um, are they are they lithophytic? Are they epiphytic? Like uh, they're they're not. They're just bushy bushy hmm. plants. I I'm assuming that most of uh, Penioceras just in general tend to grow underneath trees. I see. Uh, beautiful flowers, and um, yes. So it uh, there's definitely a lot of like memories associated with this plant. Hmm. Uh, um, interestingly. Yes, that's another one of the waxy flowers, a different one. This is Arahua salada. And so every year uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it becomes time to flower, the apex of the stem will thicken like this. Mm -hmm. Flowers will form, a little bit of that fl fluffy hair around it as well. It's like, I mean, almost like coconut coir coming out, you know, the, Absolutely. the way, yeah. Someone pointed out that if you look at it from this direction, it kind of looks like a shrimp. <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> And or like a Muppet or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. It's funny. And then once it's done flowering, it'll just keep growing from that same growth point. And so what you'll get over time is these segments that end with like uh, cocoa, uh, uh, cocoa choir. Choir? Is that how you pronounce choir, yeah. it? Choir, yeah. Okay. And then it just keeps going and stacking. That's funny. And of course, very few people like spines. And um, there's a cactus uh, with yellow spines that everyone hates. Um, but someone bred it um, specifically to lose those spines and so called it a cultivar called Caress, Opuntia microdasis Caress, <laughs> and you can definitely touch that one yeah. on the older growth, I would recommend. Yeah, because does it, does it just eventually le lose the spines? It's, the it certainly looks like it. Yeah. Yes, on the newer segments you can definitely see some more evidence of it, yeah. but it definitely loses the glockids which when you look at them underneath a microscope, a lot of them are shaped like little um, barbed hooks at the end. Mm. They work their way into the skin eventually. <laughs> exactly. So this species here, um, Salanaceras grandiflorus, has the biggest cactus flowers. And that's, so. you could find that in cultivation, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, they're just a little bit difficult to maintain uh, because they grow so quickly and they're just all over the place, but the flowers can get up to about this size and are white and nocturnal. Mm -hmm. So that's the true original queen of the night. Which seems, it seems so innocuous, right? Cause it's just like this spindly thing. Mm -hmm. And then you're just like, boom, this huge flower. Now these octopus -like looking types over here are actually the closest relative of peanut cactus, which mm. is Right here, this is a peanut cactus. Mm -hmm. Which is also something exactly. common in cultivation. And so the interesting thing about peanut cactus. I thought you put two googly eyes on those. So I was like, that's, just, that reminds me of it. That reminds me of the SNL skit. I don't know if you've ever seen them. I put googly eyes on my cacti. <laughs> so this is another one. We don't know really where it comes from in the wild. Uh, the original description was very vague. Hasn't been found, but someone did discover a species that does clearly belong in the same genus, um, 
Kamai Serra's or Echinopsis uh, Louis Romeradzii. And so this one we do know where it comes from, and it can actually hybridize with the regular peanut cactus. Hmm. Uh, it's fairly recent in its discovery, and yeah. So another fun cactus story. This used to be my favorite when I was a kid. So I started growing um, cactus when I was uh, 14, I believe, in, in Belgium. So a friend of mine decided it was a good idea to do so, and it was definitely didn't make me one of the more popular kids. <laughs> but um, it's called sometimes artichoke cactus, and it's actually a very, very close relative of barrel cactus, even though it looks completely different. And so when I was a kid and I would go to different nurseries, I would always buy one of that species, regardless of uh, where I went. Did you have interesting nurseries in Belgium? Yes, absolutely. Um, I would say that in Europe, there's a lot more um, very serious collectors than maybe in the US. And so some of the nurseries are absolutely focused on collectors and so on. So some of the You're varieties. really close to the Netherlands. So. Exactly. Yeah, so the big European convention happens in uh, Belgium on the coast uh, every year, I believe. Here's one of those disco cactus right next to a little small saguaro um, where the flower is already spent. This mm -hmm. opened a couple days ago. Um, and I didn't notice uh, until a customer here pointed out that something was poking out of this phallium. And so <laughs> I stayed up a little bit later than usual to uh, take some pictures. This one's about to bloom. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's opening up a little bit more. It's a Mexican species, Tilocactus rinconensis. How long do these blooms last? Yeah. So it's very variable between different species of cacti. Some are just a night, but others can last up to like about a week, I would say. I would say that's probably around the maximum. Mm. And so uh, for some species, and depending on environmental conditions, it varies in, in terms of how the flowers are spread out. So sometimes it's one or after the other, but more commonly you get big flushes all at the same time, but the conditions are right. And so when different individuals sync up their flowering schedules, there's a higher chance of pollination. This one reminds me of like a voodoo doll. Which one? This one. Oh, yeah. I'm stuck with all the pins, you know. Yes, so that's a very common one um, here in the southwest, Puntia engelmanii. Yeah, one definitely not to mess with. So sometimes, uh, like with any nursery, uh, cactus nurseries have to deal with pests and so on. And sometimes those are just mealybugs and red spider mites, uh, which are fairly easy to deal with. But once in a while, you also get fungal infections that are brought on by the monsoon rains. So there will be fungal spores in the rains, and they heavily affect. Um, they can heavily affect some cacti. Like in this case, I was. These were all different forms of the same species, Alexandrae and you can see a lot of fungal damage there. Yeah. D does it uh, officially kill them though? Because it seems like they have some necrotic spots and then mm -hmm. the rest are okay, perhaps? Yes, so like what I would do in this case, for example, is um, in a lot of cases they will keep growing and the new tissue will be just fine after uh, you deal with a fungal infection. And then what I'll probably do is take those segments, replant them, and then get rid of the formerly infected material mm -hmm. just to make sure there's no remaining fungal spores. Clean your tools after, too. Absolutely. This is another one of uh, those queens of the night. And it had some wool on it. Right next to it is a Euphorbia, Euphorbia tescorum, which uh, uh, I believe mostly is uh, limited to Kenya. It looks like a cactus, but it absolutely isn't. But that patterning on it is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, what, uh, what, do, you th what do you suspect is the purpose of that patterning? I have no idea whatsoever. Mm -hmm. What you can notice, however, is that the patterning always seems to connect to uh, the points where the thorns come out on the different ribs. But I do not know. I wonder if it like is, you know, like sometimes if you have like lines on a <clears throat> regular foliage species, it looks like an insect mined it. Yeah. You know, like a, there's a minor insect in it, but it'd be interesting to see if there's any kind of patterns like that in its native habitat mm -hmm. to kind of just, you know, put a few theories out there. Yeah, it's it's definitely not one of those. Euphorbias in general are tend to be very poisonous, the sap at least. Right. And so there's not a lot of herbivores that mess with them in the wild. Yeah. And they're also pretty insensitive uh, to pests in cultivation. So very handy. Sometimes the, the fruits are 
very aesthetically pleasing as well. This is a, a species of Pereschiopsis, Pereschiopsis um, uh, porteri. Is Pereschiopsis like one of the uh, initial original kind of... It's one of the more ancestral cacti. The bridge, the bridge cacti kind of. Yes, although the genetics of cactus evolution are still not very well understood, but there's a lot of work going uh, coming out very recently. Uh, but Pereschiopsis are a little bit more ancestral, yes. And their fruits are just very cool looking. And what's interesting about cactus uh, flowers and fruit is that in a lot of choya and prickly pear relatives, the fruit has an inverted morphology that allows them to actually grow roots. And so um, if I took one of these fruits and planted it, it would probably root and set out new segments. And sometimes they even do it on the plant itself. You can see this here where you have normal growth resuming and growing on top of a fruit that will just persist there for well, probably uh, years. So does that mean it just has those meristematic regions where it could just diverge and yes. create? Okay. Yeah. It's one of my favorite cactus flowers over here. This is uh, Chlysocactus or Borsicactus rosea floris. And they all have this very nice like uh, left-right symmetry to them. Um, and um, what do you think the pollinator is? is uh, I think it looks like it could be, well, something that's a long tongue, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I would probably say, too. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a Schlumbergera flower. It does have that same symmetry. Um, yeah. I, there is a term for it, I think, that starts with a Z, and I cannot think of it right now. So I, I'm pretty okay at growing cactus. I'm good at computer coding and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but my botany is uh, not my strongest aspect. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, again, this is a much more ancestral cactus from uh, the genus Brescia. Um, and the leaves are edible and are being explored for their high protein content um, in terms of, um, well, in terms of um, agriculture. Hmm. Almost like a moringa or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, this species, I believe, is Brazilian, uh, but they do range a little bit. I wouldn't put them in my salad. They're not great tasting, but uh, you know, the options are out there. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times these are famine foods yes. at the end of the day. Yeah, so like, like the common uh, myth of uh, if you get lost in the desert, eat a cactus. Uh, you could definitely do so, but you'll, uh, you'll get sick. Yeah. Um, Probably the nastiest spines are these from Xeobenthia verticalata. And the segments come off very easily and they just hurt so much and require so much effort to pull out if they do get you. Now, do any of these spines, uh, they, this one looks like porcupine quills, but porcupine quills, when you look at them under a microscope, have those kind of inverted barbs, even though you don't see it. Do any of those kind of have the similar? That, uh, the, that's pretty much the exact same morphology that you see with choyas. Kind of amazing that you have an analog in the mammalian world, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you come up with the same solutions, even if you're an animal versus a plant. Yeah. yeah. This is one of the... Um, the smaller cacti from uh, the genus Turbinicarpus. I believe it might have been reclassified now, but I, I don't want to uh, don't want to guess right now. But uh, they flower very young. They start very um, well. They stay very small, and so the flowers haven't fully opened up yet. There's multiple individuals that will open up today. So once again, I'll be able to to pop them. Um, and this one is not one. Uh, known to like hybridize very heavily, so I don't have to be as careful with it. One of your stipiliads is mm -hmm. actually blooming here. Yes. So not, that... not one of the big grand ones, but... So I can smell anything, but maybe you can. Uh, this, the label is incorrect, most likely. It's, uh, it's uh, probably going to be Desmodor Desmodorcus or Caroluma uh, hexagona. Let me see if I can smell anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, that's putrid. It's yeah. definitely a little bit worse than yeah. yesterday. That, that, that's sour. That's like a, that's like a, like sour and death together. Isn't it great? <laughs> I took yeah. a really big whiff on that one because you said it didn't really smell. So no. I was like, I'm I guess we'll never know if I tried to trick you just now, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Um, so some cacti do, uh, from an economic perspective for collectors, 
fetch a lot of uh, you know a lot of money, and that unfortunately does encourage poaching. Um, so there's a Galapagos cactus right here that um, if you were to try to buy it, this is Brachycerus nesioticus or the lava rock cactus from the Galapagos. Um, if you get a chance to look at a habitat picture, it's absolutely amazing on black lava flows, very yellow, orange tight spination. Uh, but this one um, is very difficult to find in cultivation and they, I've seen them grow up when they are available to, uh, for at least $2,000 for something this size. Here's some of those uh, interesting looking fruits that I was talking about from on the other side. This is a closely related piece to the one we were talking about earlier. Yeah, the funky one from like Brazil, was yeah. it? Yeah. Slightly different. It's the Singa subcylindrica. They which... look like comic book character, like mm -hmm. comic book uh, plants and for some reason because they're like really bulbous and funky shaped. Oh, they're fun. And then there's ones that are completely cylindrical as well. But the fruits are just beautiful in my opinion. This one is uh, a choya from the Dominican Republic. So once again, a spot you wouldn't really associate with cactus. Mm -hmm. And it looks very, uh, very similar to our native Christmas choya over here uh, in, t in terms of its growth form, um, even flowers and then the fruit. And once again, it grows regular segments from the fruits. So you can see it right here, where right? there's the red fruits and then little so does the fruit eventually uh, fall off, and then those little segments fall off with the fruit, or how does it how does it work? I'm uh, not sure, but I think that most likely yes, because the fruit is, I don't know if it's dry on the inside, but I don't think it lasts for very long, probably a year or so. So when conditions get dry, probably the fruit will drop down. There's some more of them, yes. Those are maybe boojums over there. Uh, boojums. Um, when you do get to uh, go to the Desert Museum, uh, you'll see some big ones in the ground. They have an absolutely amazing shape. Um, but the babies don't look anything like it. Um, and yeah, very beautiful plant. I'd like to have them line my, my driveway one day. <laughs> Here's one that I have no idea what it is. And nobody has any idea. So it came back uh, of seedlings that included that plant over there with the tubercles. Mm -hmm. Rajoceros riosoniensis, right here. Yeah. This was supposed to be the same thing. And we can't even figure out what genus it belongs to. Nobody's yeah. been able to figure it out. So it could be an intergeneric hybrid or it could be just something we don't even know about. For example, um, there's a big plant at the Huntington that's been there for a very long time. Um, that is clearly a member of the genus Kleistocactus, and uh, one of my friends who's, a, who's an expert on the genus has no idea. There's no Kleistocactus out there that gets as big and tall as the one at the Huntington. No idea where it could come from. So it could be a species, uh, a specimen that was collected and never described, or it could be something that's already extinct, or it could just be a growth anomaly too. Who knows? Now, of course, you've heard of old man cactus, right? Yes. So, interestingly, there's a bunch of different old man cactus. The old lady cacti. Uh -huh. yeah. This one uh, is from a group from Argentina. This is Oreocera celsianus. Um, it's not the typical old man cactus, but they all vary in their hairdos. This is more like a Bernie Sanders look, right? Yeah, very much so. But then you also have ones with very tight patterning, and we'll walk a little bit more over there. There's one. This is a traditional Mexican old man cactus. Yes. Um, slightly different hairdo once again. And then you have this really tight woolly pattern, freshly coiffured, mm -hmm. um, as postoa from South America. Lots of variation. But yeah, sometimes plants that are not closely related um, evolutionarily do come up with those same solutions. And that wool seems to have a lot to do with shading from the sun. Because one important question is, is um, with regards to cacti is that even though they're adapted to dry conditions, uh, it's not clear why. So um, do cacti grow where they do because they like it there and they do better there? Or is it because in a lot of cases, uh, their competitors can't deal with it? So they're the only ones that can tolerate those conditions. So that's the case with a lot of um, peyote, for example, uh, which tend to grow in more like limestone um, conditions where other plants really do very poorly um, of course, it has defenses against herbivores, um, 
which are, you know, masculine. So, um, but yeah, it's not clear if it just lives there because nothing else can. And if otherwise it would live somewhere different. So, and then I, if you'd like, we can take a, a peek at uh, the Choya greenhouse. This is where I just started moving um, my choice on prickly pears for the most part too. And so a lot of people don't like them um, because, well, they're pokey and painful, but there's some tremendous variation in choyas. You have the more pencil-like ones, like uh, this one here, um, Cylindra puntia or Buscula, which is native here to Arizona, or Diamond Choya, which has really cool patterns up close on the stem, Cylindra puntia ramosissima. But then you also have ones with much thicker stems, like this one right here, Cylindra puntia fulgida. Um, very nasty plant, that one. And you also have Teddy Bear Choya, um, which does not lend itself very well to growing in pots. Um, for whatever reason, we're not sure. And that's a, a crested one of the one that I showed you earlier that you could pat. Uh, yeah. pat. So the, the, the glockets on these are awful, absolutely awful. And so the one with the papery spines that you pointed out earlier, mm -hmm. This one is the same species. It's a very local form, and this one often called pinecone cactus, but it, it occurs in uh, pretty much the same populations. And um, yeah, it just doesn't have spines on it. So lots of variation there. Of course, a lot of these could go into bigger pots, but um, I'm, you know, I'm still a growing, growing business. I've only been going for a couple of years, so it's mostly me. I do have a helper who does great work, but. Uh, with everything else going on, with all the conservation work, uh, unfortunately, I cannot keep up as well as I should. So. Well, it seems really organized nonetheless. Yeah, at least the labeling system and the databasing, that's the most important aspect uh, um, for these plants, in my opinion, um, for a conservation perspective. So I keep up with that for sure. And then how do people find more about what you're doing? Um, well, you can go, if you just look for my name online, I do have a, a website over there that talks a little bit about my research and so on. Um, the paper that we published last year got a lot of media attention about the impact of climate change on cactus, so that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, more attention, the better to that issue. Um, and also, uh, there's my, um, my nursery website, pricklyprospects.com, and so yeah. We have a little bit of a logo and so on, and one of my friends who's an amazing uh, uh, designer designed those logos. Amazing. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the tour and the work that you're doing and as far as conservation because we need meet more people like you doing that. Appreciate yes. the effort. There's plenty to be done, so get into cactus. If there are a few standout cacti or succulent species that you enjoyed in this tour, let us know in the comments below. And stay tuned here because we'll be continuing our tour through the desert landscape of Tucson, Arizona, here on Plant One On Me. Now, if you'd like to support the channel, consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notifications button, and even tipping. 1% of our Google AdSense proceeds here are donated back to plant conservation. And for the last two years, we've been able to support the IUCN SSC Cactus and Succulent Plant Specialist Group through the Desert Botanical Garden, which has been doing important work on cactus and succulent conservation worldwide. Additionally, we have a host of online houseplant courses and new downloads available, like the Medicinal Herbal Flowchart, as seen on our sister channel at Flock Finger Lakes. So check all that out on our website over at homesteadbrooklyn.com. We'll see you in the next video.